Greetings. So as you must have been following in the news, the Federal Reserve is continuing on its aggressive taper policy, as well as embarking upon rate increases, which is exactly what it should not be doing, as I've explained on this channel many times. The amount of quantitative easing that has to be done worldwide has to rise exponentially just to offset exponential technological deflation. And more simply, the Federal Reserve has done exactly the same thing about five times before over the past 11 years with predictably bad results because they don't understand the first principles of technology and economics. They are very theoretical creatures. They react to things that have only happened 12 to 18 months ago and never look towards the future. And I will explain what that means, but they are repeating the same mistake that they have already made many times under a belief that now they can permanently end QE and return interest rates to a 3% Fed funds rate, which is insane because they haven't had a 3% Fed funds rate in over a decade and they never will. So let me take you over to the transcript of Chairman Powell's speech and nothing about him in particular. He is just the representative of the entire body of PhD economist thought. So this is the transcript of the statement on Calculated Risk blog. And as you can see here, the committee expects it will soon be appropriate to raise the target for the Fed funds rate. The committee decided to continue to reduce the monthly pace of its net asset purchases, bringing them to an end by early March. So this is a pretty aggressive reduction of quantitative easing. Remember, it should not be reduced. It should always either be staying flat or going up because the trend line is always upwards. So it is going from $120 billion a month down to zero dollars per month and then a reversal a negative so while november was 120 billion december was 90 january is 60 february is 30 and march is zero and march is where they expect to have a rate hike and then the stock market will correct and they'll reverse course and never admit that they don't know what they're doing but let me show you what you should really look at which is something very obscure called the wu jia shadow rate this is a very obscure economic indicator made by two people that you've never heard of. And what it does is that it combines the effect of the Fed funds rate with quantitative easing being done because quantitative easing has been an attempt to simulate a negative interest rate to create a positive yield curve. And this is to account for technological deflation pervading across the economy, except the creators don't realize this, nor does anyone else in the field of economics. And you can see the trend is very starkly down as it should be because deflation is exponential. So every time they undo quantitative easing, making this negative Wuja shadow rate up to zero, and then they raise the Fed funds rate, trying to make it higher, they think they're trying to get to a normal amount such as 3%, which is over here. But since the trend is down, this gap is getting larger and larger. As you can see here where my cursor is, the Wuja shadow rate has already ticked up significantly. And this is as of January 5th. So in a few days, we'll have the February amount and it's gonna be higher still because of the reduction in quantitative easing. And this portends to a stock market crash and an economic recession or near recession, which will force the Federal Reserve to lower interest rates and to print more money again. That's already happened five or six times. It's extremely predictable, yet it's going to occur again because remember, they have memorized all these economics textbooks that have 1950s to 1970s era thought. They have no concept of the accelerating rate of change, the connection between technology and financial deflation, economic deflation, and why exponential technology leads to exponential deflation. Now you have to watch a lot of videos on this channel to understand all of that. But if you've gotten this far, you've gotten to this video, you are extremely far ahead of the curve. And even if you only partly understand what I'm talking about here, at least you realize that this 3% Fed funds rate is not normal. They use that word normalize. The Federal Reserve dot plot, which I'll go to next, shows you what the consensus of all those decorated PhD economists, the very topmost people in their field, they still think that the Wuja shadow rate effectively will be over here and that there won't be any quantitative easing anymore. Whereas I have said separately in this video over here that March 15th, 2020, almost two years ago, March 15, 2020 was the Netscape moment in economics. That was the time when a lot of assumptions had to be shaken loose and the world really went towards an irreversible trend of exponential money printing. The PhD economists of the world have not figured that out yet, but the technology industry effectively has, even in an unspoken sense. And while the 2020s is something that the PhD economists believe will be a deprinting, a negative printing of 23 trillion, reversing the $23 trillion printed in the 2010s. 
I say that the 2020s will have $100 trillion of money printing just to keep up with the exponential trend. So economists think minus 23 trillion, as in a reverse printing of minus 23 trillion, undoing the 23 trillion of the 2010s decade. I say another 100 trillion. And remember, this is a very good thing. My forecast is the optimistic one because I account for exponential accelerating economic growth, which has been the trend all along for all of human history and for long before that too, in terms of other metrics of accelerating rate of change. Now the Wuja shadow rate is such an obscure metric that you may have never heard about it before, and it only accounts for US numbers. Now, as I often say, QE has to be worldwide, but other central banks of the world are tapering as well, and they're all printing less, as we saw from my recent monthly update on worldwide quantitative easing. So let me take an excerpt from that video to explain this further. Now, what is the annual percentage growth rate? That is what's important. So we go down to that chart. Now, as you can see here, the annual percentage growth rate has been within a band in the low teens with a few distortions. The COVID-19 crisis got cumulative money printing all the way up to a 46% year over year growth rate, but that was just offsetting this negative growth rate of before. So it didn't change the band by any amount at all. And now we're down to just 8.5% year over year growth. So all the chance of high inflation that everyone was worried about from all the COVID-19 related stimuli, that is in the past because that was almost a year ago that this number peaked and now it's down to a rate that's below the optimal band. I say this should always be between 16 to 24% a year just to offset deflation. If it went above 24%, that could cause inflation. And it did go above that briefly, but as we will see later in this video, the inflation effect was very muted and very delayed. And that's going on a little bit right now, but it is so muted that it's not a historically significant event. It's something people will forget about by April, May, June, when all of that brief inflation blip has moderated because of the shortage of new liquidity that we see here. 8.5% year over year growth is too little. Fine, maybe it's offsetting this unusually high peak, but that peak was offsetting this reduction over here. The band has to stay within 16 to 24% as per my Atom thesis, which some of you are familiar with, and those of you who are relatively new to this channel should look at that both on this channel as well as the text version that is on the web, and that'll be in the description box below. Now, on the subject of how the US media seems disproportionately scared about money printing, and you have all sorts of pundits who have predicted inflation so many times, whether they are PhD economists or whether they are so-called money managers like Peter Schiff, they have all predicted about 100 of the last zero bouts of hyperinflation and they have been wrong every single time. And that doesn't stop them from repeating the same thing because they've memorized a certain thing. And in addition to that, the point of how the United States is seen as the only country in the world where money printing matters. So we're going to debunk that as well. You hear all the screaming how the US Federal Reserve printing money will cause inflation and will cause gold to go up. But here in proportion to the GDP of the country in question, the United States is actually one of the lowest. US money printing has only been about 35% of US GDP. And this is cumulative money printing over many years where GDP is an annual metric. But the United States is at 35%, whereas Europe is twice that amount, almost 70%, and Japan is four times that amount at 134.6%. So Japan has done four times as much QE in proportion to the size of its economy as the United States has done, yet nobody claims Japan has high inflation. Even the people who claim the United States is already in hyperinflation, even hyperinflation, they don't claim that Japan has high inflation, and therefore they really don't know what's going on. If they say United States money printing is going to cause hyperinflation, but Japan can print four times as much money and there is no aberrant inflation in Japan, they don't know what's going on. Their entire premise is flawed and they have been exposed as a complete charlatan in terms of their supposed expertise. So Japan has called the bluff of the notion that money printing can cause inflation. Now, remember, the other reason this has not occurred is that Japan's QE spills outside of Japan's borders and goes over the whole world. As we just saw a few minutes ago, the only metric that matters is the worldwide total because technology is borderless and monetary creation is borderless. Therefore, only the worldwide total matters because the accelerating technonomic medium, the atom, the collective force of all technology in the world, 
being borderless absorbs quantitative easing and the United States could in theory stop all QE and just draw from the QE of other countries that would cause some distortions in currency exchange rates but much more muted than one might expect. Japan has done four times as much QE as the United States relative to the size of the economy and Europe the people who are supposedly the most afraid of inflation they have done twice as much as the United States. The U.S. is at the bottom over here. And yet the U.S. has the greatest number of fear mongers screaming about how hyperinflation is about to happen tomorrow. It's truly absurd when you think about it. Okay, so over there we saw that the year-over-year -year growth rate of worldwide QE is only 8.5%. That is below what my estimate of 16 to 24% as the necessary amount should be. So we are already creating a liquidity shortage in the market, which leads to a stock market crash. A stock market crash between February and August is a very high probability event and then they'll just have to print more money. Also all the notion of an uptick inflation that we're seeing and now a couple of metrics have risen all that will be reversed. Now the other problem though and this is why this is a little bit of a dangerous situation is mismanagement by the US government and a deliberate clampdown on US fracking has caused oil and natural gas prices to rise therefore commodity prices are rising and this is contributing to inflation. I have always said inflation can only happen through government mismanagement not through quantitative easing because quantitative easing merely offsets that's technological deflation. The problem is they will attribute this to QE. So the Federal Reserve is tapering when they exactly should not be doing that. Instead, President Biden and the US government and Republicans are culpable in this too. So it's not a partisan thing per se, but the Biden administration is trying to shut down the single best thing that happened to the US economy in the last decade, which is hydraulic fracturing, which lowered the price of oil, lowered the price of natural gas, and reduced US imports of crude oil, which I talk about over here. And this is being reversed. That's why oil prices are high, natural gas prices are high, and this is contributing to a temporary rise in inflation statistics, which is then causing the Federal Reserve to overreact in terms of tightening, and therefore a stock market crash. It's terrible and government incompetence can wreck everything and that is what is going on right now. So if they were not clamping down fracking only because of some bizarre notion of global warming, which is silly because any oil that is not bought from U.S. producers will instead be bought from imported oil. So U.S. consumers will either buy U.S. domestic oil or imported oil from the Middle East. The notion that this reduces oil consumption, except in a very long-term and indirect way, is completely wrong. Yet, since they want to shut down global warming, they want to shut down the oil production of just one country so that people buy the same oil from other countries. That's the logic of that. But U.S. politics is in a terrible state of anti-intellectualism as I talk about in this video over here. So a lot of topics to talk about. But the U.S. Federal Reserve's tightening is now fully underway and a stock market correction in the relatively near future, again, some point between February and August, is a virtual certainty after which they will start printing money again. Another problem that will arise after that is they will still be buying treasuries and mortgage-backed securities, which is an oversaturated form of QE and has less and less of a stimulative effect. So they'll buy more and more treasuries and mortgage-backed securities for less and less impact. All market forces are therefore going towards what I have advocated since early 2016 is that money printing should be in the form of cash sent directly to people. It should not be recorded as a cumulative amount in the form of a balance sheet because that still presumes it has to be reversed. Stop trying to reverse that. You cannot reverse your age. So stop trying to reverse cumulative monetary creation. And after the stock market crash, they'll be printing more money than ever before. I still say that my prediction of the 2020s having $100 trillion of money printing is very much on track. I made that prediction on January 1st, 2020. And now two years in with the $11 trillion that have been printed, I'd say that trend is on track. The fact that they're trying to tighten as measured by this Wuja shadow rate is something that will be reversed yet again, just like all the other time they tried to reverse it, rather than accept this wonderful new reality for what it is. So let me show you the Federal Reserve dot plots in closing, most recently December 15, 2021. So they actually think the Fed funds rate median is gonna be at 2.5%. Now for decades, they thought 3% is normal. At least they have come down to thinking 2.5% is normal. That's progress. But in the Wuja shadow rate that we just saw, the greatest economic activity without inflation was at minus 2% and that's going exponentially. I believe that should soon be minus 3, minus 4% just to accommodate exponential economic growth as per the long-term established trend line. So the Federal Reserve, these PhD economists still think that 2.5% is normal 
whereas Wuja Shadow Rate is already showing the opposite. This is tantamount to believing that an adult should still be eating baby food. That is how misguided these PhD economists, these hyper theoretical people who only interact with people like each other and have no outside information percolating into their thick skulls. That is the problem they're gonna cause. Stock market crash, economic dislocation, more printing, new stock market highs after that, but a lot of volatility in between that caused a lot of people a lot of hardship, stress, and misery, which was completely unnecessary. That is what's going to happen because a small number of PhD economists just don't know anything about their own field. Anyway, this video had a lot of topics and it would be too long if I explained each one in detail. So this was obviously a video of a very advanced nature. Hopefully you found this informative and if you like this type of content, I encourage you to subscribe to this channel. Thank you very much for watching.